Today I'll be reading Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth disappeared, and the sea vanished. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready like a bride dressed to meet her husband. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's home is with people. He will live with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief, no crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. God. He created the earth, he created us, and we go through life going, why did you do that? <laughs> well, I've been trying to explain to you that he has a purpose, and it leads up to some things that are very common to you. You know these things. Well, today, we're going to talk about the marriage story of Jesus. Now, I told you on the first week that Adam we're told by Paul, is a shadow or an image of the coming Christ. Adam couldn't find anybody to live with, and so God put him into sleep, took out his rib, and made a woman out of it. Here's a mystery. Adam always had his wife with him. And then, in that same way, Jesus could not find anyone who was perfect, and so God put him on the cross into a deep sleep. As he died, his side was opened up and the blood came out. And out of that blood, we are sanctified and the church becomes the bride of Christ. Jesus had a woman hiding inside of him too. Last week, we talked about the marriage of Isaac and how Abraham sent off his nameless servant to go out and find a wife from foreign lands, to bring her out of the foreign lands and into this family. He goes and he finds her, brings her back, gives her treasures, and talks about how wonderful his master's son is. And as she finally falls in love from a distance, then she sees the master's son, and the nameless servant says, That's my master. Changing from the son into the master himself, and she marries him. And that nameless servant is like the Holy Spirit who entices us and pulls us in and gives us gifts in the entire journey until that day that we finally get to see the one we will love forever. But today, I want us to focus on this story from Revelation in which it is announced from heaven, Behold the Bride. Who is she? What's she like? How is she adorned? Well, standing in the very center of God's purpose for all of creation, for everything that you've had to go through in your life, through everything that history has shown us, the very central purpose is for that bride to become beautified, perfected, healed, and made ready for the day of the wedding. This is God's real purpose. We pray for such small things. I wonder what God's will is for me to choose uh, the college that I go to. Choose the college you want to go to. And when you get there, do it because you want to serve God. And I've heard people pray, you know, what's God's will? Should I buy a Ford or a Chevy? Well, of course, we all know the answer is Ford, but <laughs> buy the car you like because you want to serve the Lord with it. God's purpose is not so shallow. God's purpose is beautify the wife, help her to grow, help her to make a kingdom with the husband that she has been promised to. It's that simple. But to do that, I want to today 
give you an image, another foreshadowing that's harder to pull out of the Bible. It's the Hebrew tradition of marriage. You know, we have marriage traditions. We get the, the, the girl gets a white dress, the guy rents a tux because nobody owns tuxes anymore. And, and we rent a church or we rent a garden and we, we have a, a way of doing things. There's rings involved. It, when I was in Taiwan, I did a couple of weddings and they've got totally different traditions over there. Every place in the world has slightly different traditions. The earliest wedding traditions that we know of on earth are the Hebrew traditions. And these Hebrew traditions come out of the revelation, the, the words of God to his people, to the patriarchs and to the prophets. And over centuries, these traditions became very much a part of the Hebrew people. This marriage tradition was spoken about by Jesus. And when you read the New Testament, you probably don't see it that closely because you don't have those traditions. You grew up here and you don't have the Hebrew traditions. And so I want us to look at some of these Hebrew traditions to understand what Jesus is talking about. Jesus performs his first miracle at a wedding. Jesus calls himself the bridegroom. He refers to himself as the bridegroom. John refers to him as the bridegroom. Jesus has a parable about weddings, wedding feasts, young ladies at weddings. Wedding seems to be very important to him. It seems to be that if we explore this idea of Hebrew marriage, we might have a better understanding of things that we read in the Gospels. In Hebrew marriage, the groom's father arranges the marriage and selects the bride that he will marry. Got that? Your dad, he gets to choose. You have no say. Well, you do have some say. But dating was non-existent. Father spent energy, time, study to find the right bride. Now the bride and the groom have a say. Don't get it wrong. They weren't slaves. But the father does the research. Why? Because the son's out working in the field and he doesn't have time to go date. Dad, he's the supervisor. <laughs> and he has time to go and look for the right family choices, the right upbringing, the right woman. And so, Jesus says in John 17, Father, I'm not praying for the world. I'm praying for those you have given to me, for they are yours. I want to throw something at you that you might not have thought of. And I want to say, first of all, that Jesus died to save every single person on earth. But he died specifically for those who would love him. He has these people that will love him. There's a parable about the man who goes out into a field and he digs up a treasure. And it's a beautiful treasure and he wants that treasure. But the field is not his field. And so he puts the treasure back in the ground and he goes and he finds the guy that owns the field. And he buys the entire field for the treasure. Jesus bought the entire world with his blood, but he's after the people that will trust him. And so he says, right before he's crucified, Father, I'm not praying for the world. I'm praying for those you gave me, the woman you chose to be my bride. Now, the young man then has to propose. And he does this by going to the father of the young woman and setting out the marital contract. Now we just have vows up here at a wedding, but the young man has to go and convince this father, I'm going to be the good husband. And I've set out a 50-year a, a plan of how I'm going to be the good husband. He shows how he's going to earn a living for her. 
how he's going to care for her, and he makes it a legally binding contract. And he has to convince both the father and the young woman that he knows what he's talking about, and he's going to fulfill all of his promises. Now, some people have the idea that this young woman doesn't have a choice in all this, but she does. Because the next thing that happens is after the father agrees that the plan is a good plan, the young man must hand the young woman a glass of wine. If she takes it, she's accepting the engagement. But she has the right to slide the cup away. Are we offered a cup? You just took one. This cup of wine, you give thanks for it, and Jesus gives it to his disciples as he gives it to you and says that everybody that drinks from this cup, which is his blood, a symbol of his blood, confirms the covenant, the contract between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. We come to this cup every Sunday to remind ourselves that we're engaged. We have accepted an offer. We have accepted a proposal of marriage. And now we are engaged. Any young woman here remember the excitement of being engaged? Yeah? That was a pretty special time. Well, then you get married and you know what they're really like. But, but the engagement is that exciting time. There's lots of mystery in that time. We should be looking at this as that exciting mystery of what, what could be coming. What could be next? If the young woman accepts the proposed cup, the groom then must pay for her. Ooh. We hate that, don't we? Because it sounds like we're buying livestock. But this wasn't livestock. She had to accept, and then her father gets a dowry. There's some practicalness to this. You know, the father's losing some farm work. But there's a much better reason for this. Young man, how serious are you? Are you just making empty promises? Are you just saying words that you're not going to mean a year down the road? This isn't payment. This is investment. Because when this father dies, the young ladies might be looking at some of that. At least the sons will. This was a matter of importance. Value. Do you know what value really is? Would you buy a pound of mud from me? Would you? I just went out in my backyard and dug up some mud. Would you buy a pound of mud from me? One of my stepfathers made a lot of money selling mud. Because different kinds of mud can be used for different purposes. He sold mud to the oil well companies. They used a lot of mud. Don't even ask me why. They put value into something. Money doesn't make value your desire for it makes value. There's a video going around the internet of people being offered one pound of chocolate or one pound of silver. Most of them take the chocolate. What are you going to do with silver? Young man, do you value this woman? Will you suffer for this woman? Will you give up for this woman? And so Jesus buys us with his blood. Paul tells us that you were bought with a price, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life that you lived. You were bought with the blood of Christ. He was willing to die for you. That's the commitment of this groom to us. Now, in the Hebrew wedding, the young lady has to wait now, sometimes up to two years before the actual marriage. She is without the groom for this entire time. And he sends 
gifts to her. Many of these gifts are more valuable than the dowry. But they're not for the father. They're not for the family. They are for her. For the purpose of adding value. Adding worth. Showing his great love for her. They come out through the year. She doesn't know when they're coming. And these gifts are meant to enhance both her beauty and her stature for her social standing. Jesus did the same thing for you in that he promised just before he left this earth that he would send the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit would give you gifts, reminding you of who the Son was, keeping you <laughs> excited and wondering during this whole betrothal period. Now, in the modern age, we often tell young people, you don't want to be engaged for two years. That's too long to be engaged. But in this system, the young lady was constantly being reminded, your groom is coming. When is he coming? I don't know. Don't you hate those TV shows that end on a cliffhanger? And this is what's happening. Each one of them, at the time of the engagement, takes a ritual bath separately. They don't do it with each other. They both go and take a ritual bath, which legally binds them under Jewish law to be engaged in such a way that they cannot separate without divorce. But yet, they continue to wait for up to two years. The bride will spend her time making herself ready. The groom will spend his time making something else ready that we'll talk about in a moment. This period of time that the young lady is making herself ready is referred to as being set apart and being sanctified. Does that sound familiar? Because Jesus Christ saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. We symbolize it through baptism, ritual washing. Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her. I promise you one husband, Christ, and that might yeah, that you might present or that he might present you as a pure virgin to him. You are being sanctified in this life. You're going through troubles, you're going through difficulties, and you're wondering where the Lord is right now. You are being given gifts during that time that perfect you and change you and mature you for that day. Well, what is the groom doing all this time? It was the groom's job to go home to his father's house and prepare a bridal chamber. And folks, this took time, up to two years. So it wasn't just repainting the walls. It was preparing a home. And he had to get it right because father would inspect it. I always hated it when somebody said, you know, clean your room and I'm going to come look under the bed. Don't look under the bed. The father is going to come and inspect and see if this room is right. If it's, does it value her? And Jesus said to us, you know, I'm going, but I want you to know that I'm going to return. And what am I doing in that time? He says, I'm I've got a house, that my father's house, and it has many, many rooms. And I'm going to prepare one for you. We read that and we don't realize that every Jewish man in that room would have understood exactly what he was saying. He's preparing a bridal chamber for those who come and become part of the family of God. The bride, one day, is told, groom is coming now. Now? I was just cooking. I was just farming. He's coming now. And she goes and she gets ready. She puts on her traveling clothes. She packs her bags. And then she says, where is he? And they say, well, he's coming. And she would sometimes have to wait up to two weeks because he's coming. But you don't get to know when. This was part of the Hebrew tradition, that as she was waiting, she was supposed to wait all night 
long until he arrived. This is the story, the parable of the ten foolish girls with the, the oil that ran out because they hadn't prepared. Jesus is coming for his bride, and we are to wait. But no one knows the day or the hour. He wants to come and find us both ready and waiting. Not just waiting and not just ready. There are so many scriptures that talk about how Jesus is coming. He will come on a night without warning. He will take us away to be married to him in heaven. Now here's the grossest part. Part of Hebrew to tradition. Do you ever wonder why there's a best man? His job was to stand outside of the bridal chamber during the wedding party. And when he heard the voice of the bridegroom, he was supposed to run out into the party and say, they're really married now. That's part of the law of the Old Testament. And then the party would continue for the next seven days. And the bride and the groom would stay in that room for seven days as the party went on outside. A little too public for me, but he who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, Jesus says in John 3, who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. Jesus is saying to us here that this marriage to him is not some private, by yourself thing. It's public. It's not something that we keep secret and say, well, you know, I don't talk about politics or religion. Well, let's, let's say, let's not talk about politics, okay? That what we're talking about is not religion. When I, when I talk to people about Sandy and they say, so do you love Sandy? Yes, I attend a service with Sandy once a week where I talk about her wonderful qualities. That's religion. I have a relationship with her. And Jesus is desiring this same relationship with you. After seven days, they come out of the chamber and the marriage feast begins. I can see all these fathers with daughters thinking, I could never afford all this. After seven days of the party, then comes the feast. Throughout the book of Revelation, people study it, and there's all these references to seven weeks or seven days, and it's a reference to this marriage contract that at the end, we stand up with Jesus as his bride, the Father seats us at a table, and the entire world rejoices at the wedding feast. Revelation chapter 19. The Bible is the story of someone who loves you, who has promised you, and who is coming for you. The theme of bridal love is at the very center of the Bible. The father chooses a bride for his son. The bride, or the son rather, leaves his home and humbles himself as a human. He pays the dowry in his own blood for the bride that he will love forever. And the Spirit lures us and enchants us and captivates us with the stories and the gifts of who this Son and His Father are. This is the very heart and soul of the promise of God. This is God's promise to you. Will you take the cup? Will you take that cup and say, I'll wait for Him. Next week, we're going to continue this theme, and we've gotten past the marriage now. What does God want for his son? He wants him to build a home. Not a building, but a home. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the way that you love us. I, I so often want to turn my religion into a set of rules and a set of actions and a set of things I've done. But Lord, you hold me and tell me that you love me when I'm sick, when I'm happy, when I'm scared and when I'm brave. You put your hand on me and tell me how much you love me. Lord, you gift this church with many wonderful gifts to show her that you love her and that you are going to take her home to a place that you have been preparing for her. In my week of work and school, help me to remember that you are coming. Help me to remember that there is going to be a wedding that will end all of this life and give me a new life together with this church as one family in one home. Amen.